Section 9 of Arts and Crafts Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Yearsley. Stained Glass by Summers Clark. In these days, there is a tendency to judge the merits of stained glass from the standpoint of the archaeologist. It is good or bad in so far as it is directly imitative of work of the fourteenth or fifteenth century. The art had reached to a surprising degree of beauty and perfection in the fifteenth century, and although under the influence of the Renaissance some good work was done, it rapidly declined only to lift its head once more with the revived study of the architecture of the Middle Ages. The burning energy of Pugin, which nothing could escape, was directed towards this end, but the attainment of a mere archaeological correctness was the chief aim in view. The crude draughtsmanship of the ancient craftsmen was diligently imitated, but the spirit and charm of the original was lost, as in a mere imitation it must be. In the revival of the art, whilst there was an attempt to imitate the drawing there was no attempt to reproduce the quality of the ancient glass thus brilliant transparent and unbroken tints were used lacking all the richness and splendour of colour so characteristic of the originals under these conditions of blind imitation the modern worker in stained glass produced things probably more hideous than the world ever saw before. Departing altogether from the traditions of the medieval schools, whether ancient or modern, there has arisen another school which has found its chief exponents at Munich. The object of these people has been, ignoring the conditions under which they must necessarily work, to produce an ordinary picture in enameled colours upon sheets of glass. The result has been the production of mere transparencies, no better than painted blinds. What then, it may be asked, are the limiting conditions imposed upon him by the nature of the materials, within which the craftsman must work to produce a satisfactory result? In the first place, a stained glass window is not an easel picture. It does not stand within a frame as does the easel picture, in isolation from the objects surrounding it. It is not even an object to be looked at by itself. Its duty is not only to be beautiful, but to play its part in the adornment of the building in which it is placed, being subordinated to the effect the interior is intended to produce as a whole. It is, in fact, but one of many parts that go to produce a complete result. A visit to one of our medieval churches, such as York Minster, Gloucester Cathedral or Malvern Priory, church buildings which still retain much of their ancient glass, and a comparison of the unity of effect there experienced with the internecine struggle exhibited in most buildings furnished by the glass painters of today, will surely convince the most indifferent that there is yet much to be learned. Secondly, the great difference between coloured glass and painted glass must be kept in view. A coloured glass window is in the nature of a mosaic. Not only are no large pieces of glass used, but each piece is separated from and at the same time joined to its neighbour by a thin grooved strip of lead which holds the two. Coloured glass is obtained by a mixture of metallic oxides whilst in a state of fusion. This colouring pervades the substance of the glass and becomes incorporated with it. It is termed pot metal. An examination of such a piece of glass will show it to be full of varieties of a given colour, uneven in thickness, full of little air bubbles and other accidents, which cause the rays of light to play in and through it with endless variety of effect. It is the exact opposite to the clear sheet of ordinary window glass. To build up a decorative work, and such a form of expression may be found very appropriate in this craft, in coloured glass, 
the pieces must be carefully selected the gradations of tint in a given piece being made use of to gain the result aimed at the leaded canes by which the whole is held together are made use of to aid the effect fine lines and hatchings are painted as with silver stain and in this respect only is there any approach to enamelling in the making of a coloured glass window the glass mosaic as above described is held in its place in the window by horizontal iron bars and the position of these is a matter of some importance and is by no means overlooked by the artist in considering the effect of his finished work a well-designed coloured glass window is in fact like nothing else in the world but itself it is not only a mosaic it is not merely a picture it is the honest outcome of the use of glass for making a beautiful window which shall transmit light and not look like anything but what it is the effect of the work is obtained by the contrast of the rich colours of the pot metal with the pearly tones of the clear glass we must now describe a painted window so that the distinction between a coloured and a painted window may be clearly made out quoting from the same book as before to paint glass the artist uses a plate of translucent glass and applies the design and colouring with vitrifiable colours these colours true enamels are the product of metallic oxides combined with vitreous compounds called fluxes through the medium of these assisted by a strong heat the colouring matters are fixed upon the plate of glass in the painted window we are invited to forget that glass is being used shadows are obtained by loading the surface with enamel colours the fullest rotundity of modelling is aimed at the lead and iron so essentially necessary to the construction and safety of the window are concealed with extraordinary skill and ingenuity the spectator perceives a hole in the wall with a very indifferent picture in it overdone in the highlights smoky and unpleasant in the shadows in no sense decorative we need concern ourselves no more with painted windows they are thoroughly false and unworthy of consideration of coloured or stained windows as they are more commonly called many are made mostly bad but there are amongst us a few who know how to make them well and these are better than any made elsewhere in europe at this time summers clark End of section 9section 10 of arts and crafts essays this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org table glass by summers clark few materials lend themselves more readily to the skill of the craftsman than glass the fluid or viscous condition of the metal as it comes from the pot the way in which it is shaped by the breath of the craftsman and by his skill in making use of centrifugal force these and many other things too numerous to mention are all manifested in the triumphs of the venetian glass blower at the first glance we see that the vessel he has made is of a material once liquid he takes the fullest advantage of the conditions under which he works and the result is a beautiful thing which can be produced in but one way for many centuries the old methods were followed but with the power to produce the metal or glass of extreme purity and transparency came the desire to leave the old paths and produce work in imitation of crystal the wheel came into play and cut and engraved glass became general at first there was nothing but a genuine advance or variation on the old modes the specimens of clear glass made at the end of the seventeenth and beginning of the eighteenth centuries are well designed to suit the capabilities of the material the form given to the liquid metal by the craftsman's skill is still manifest its delicate transparency accentuated here and there by cutting the surface into small facets 
or engraving upon it graceful designs but as skill increased so taste degraded the graceful outlines and natural curves of the old workers gave place to distortions of line but too common in all decorative works of the period a little later and the material was produced in mere lumps cut and tormented into a thousand surfaces suggesting that the work was made from the solid as in part it was this miserable stuff reached its climax in the early years of the present reign since then a great reaction has taken place for example the old decanter a massive lump of misshapen material better suited to the purpose of braining a burglar than decorating a table has given place to a light and gracefully formed vessel covered in many cases with well-designed surface engraving and thoroughly suited both to the uses it is intended to fulfill and the material of which it is made and not only so but a distinct variation and development upon the old types has been made the works produced have not been merely copies but they have their own character it is not necessary to describe the craft of the glass blower it is sufficient to say that he deals with a material which when it comes to his hands is a liquid solidifying rapidly on exposure to the air that there is hardly a limit to the delicacy of the film that can be made and in addition to using a material of one color different colors can be laid one over the other the outer ones being afterwards cut through by the wheel leaving a pattern in one color on a ground of another there has developed itself of late an unfortunate tendency to stray from the path of improvement but a due consideration on the part both of the purchaser and of the craftsman of how the material should be used will result it may be hoped in farther advances on the right road end of section 10 recording by linda johnson section 11 of arts and crafts essays this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org printing by william morris and emery walker printing in the only sense with which we are at present concerned differs from most if not from all the arts and crafts represented in the exhibition in being comparatively modern for although the chinese took impressions from wood blocks engraved in relief for centuries before the woodcutters of the netherlands by a similar process produced the block books which were the immediate predecessors of the true printed book the invention of movable metal letters in the middle of the fifteenth century may justly be considered as the invention of the art of printing and it is worth mention in passing that as an example of fine typography the earliest book printed with movable types the gutenberg or forty-two line bible of about fourteen fifty five has never been surpassed printing then for our purpose may be considered as the art of making books by means of movable types now as all books not primarily intended as picture books consist principally of types composed to form letterpress it is of the first importance that the letter used should be fine in form especially as no more time is occupied or cost incurred in casting setting or printing beautiful letters than in the same operations with ugly ones and it was a matter of course that in the middle ages when the craftsmen took care that beautiful forms should always be a part of their productions whatever they were the forms of printed letters should be beautiful and that their arrangement on the page should be reasonable and a help to the shapeliness of the letters themselves the middle ages brought calligraphy to perfection and it was natural therefore that the forms of printed letters should follow more or less closely those of the written character and they followed them very closely the first books were printed in black letter i e the letter which was a gothic development of the ancient roman character and which developed more completely and satisfactorily on the side of the lower case than the capital letters 
the lower case being in fact invented in the early middle ages the earliest book printed with movable type the aforesaid guttenberg bible is printed in letters which are an exact imitation of the more formal ecclesiastical writing which obtained at that time this has since been called missal type and was in fact the kind of letter used in the many splendid missals psalters etc produced by printing in the fifteenth century but the first bible actually dated which also was printed at mainz by peter schoffer in the year fourteen sixty two imitates a much freer hand simpler rounder and less spiky and therefore far pleasanter and easier to read on the whole the type of this book may be considered the ne plus ultra of gothic type especially as regards the lower case letters and type very similar was used during the next fifteen or twenty years not only by schoffer but by printers in strasbourg basel paris lubeck and other cities but though on the whole except in italy gothic letter was most often used a very few years saw the birth of roman character not only in italy but in germany and france in fourteen sixty five swainheim and panarts began printing in the monastery of subiaco near rome and used an exceedingly beautiful type which is indeed to look at a transition between gothic and roman but which must certainly have come from the study of the twelfth or even the eleventh century m s s they printed very few books in this type three only but in their very first books in rome beginning with the year fourteen sixty eight they discarded this for a more completely roman and far less beautiful letter but about the same year mentelin at strasbourg began to print in a type which is distinctly roman and the next year gunther zeiner at augsburg followed suit while in fourteen seventy at paris udelrich gering and his associates turned out the first books printed in france also in roman character the roman type of all these printers is similar in character and is very simple and legible and unaffectedly designed for use but it is by no means without beauty it must be said that it is in no way like the transition type of subiaco and though more roman than that yet scarcely more like the complete roman type of the earliest printers of rome a further development of the roman letter took place at venice john of spires and his brother vindelin followed by nicholas jensen began to print in that city fourteen sixty nine fourteen seventy their type is on the lines of the german and french rather than of the roman printers of jensen it must be said that he carried the development of roman type as far as it can go his letter is admirably clear and regular but at least as beautiful as any other roman type after his death in the fourteen eighties or at least by fourteen ninety printing in venice had declined very much and though the famous family of aldus restored its technical excellence rejecting battered letters and paying great attention to the press work or actual process of printing yet their type is artistically on a much lower level than jensen's and in fact they must be considered to have ended the age of fine printing in italy jensen however had many contemporaries who used beautiful type some of which as e g that of jacobus rubius or jacques le rouge is scarcely distinguishable from his it was these great venetian printers together with their brethren of rome milan parma and one or two other cities who produced the splendid editions of the classics which are one of the great glories of the printer's art and are worthy representatives of the eager enthusiasm for the revived learning of that epoch by far the greater part of these italian printers it should be mentioned were germans or frenchmen working under the influence of italian opinion and aims it must be understood that through the whole of the fifteenth and the first quarter of the sixteenth centuries the roman letter was used side by side with the gothic even in italy 
most of the theological and law books were printed in gothic letter which was generally more formally gothic than the printing of the german workmen many of whose types indeed like that of the subiaco works are of a transitional character this was notably the case with the early works printed at Ulm, and in a somewhat lesser degree at augsburg in fact gunther zeiner's first type afterwards used by schussler is remarkably like the type of the before-mentioned subiaco books in the low countries and cologne which were very fertile of printed books gothic was the favorite the characteristic dutch type as represented by the excellent printer gerard liu is very pronounced and uncompromising gothic this type was introduced into england by winkin de word caxton's successor and was used there with very little variation all through the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries and indeed into the eighteenth most of caxton's own types are of an earlier character though they also much resemble flemish or cologne letter after the end of the fifteenth century the degradation of printing especially in germany and italy went on apace and by the end of the sixteenth century there was no really beautiful printing done the best mostly french or low country was neat and clear but without any distinction the worst which perhaps was the english was a terrible falling off from the work of the earlier presses and things got worse and worse through the whole of the seventeenth century so that in the eighteenth printing was very miserably performed in england about this time an attempt was made notably by caslon who started business in london as a type founder in seventeen twenty to improve the letter in form caslon's type is clear and neat and fairly well designed he seems to have taken the letter of the Elzevirs of the seventeenth century for his model. Type cast from his matrices is still in everyday use. In spite, however, of his praiseworthy efforts, printing had still one last degradation to undergo. The seventeenth century founts were bad rather negatively than positively. But for the beauty of the earlier work, they might have seemed tolerable it was reserved for the founders of the later eighteenth century to produce letters which are positively ugly and which it may be added are dazzling and unpleasant to the eye owing to the clumsy thickening and vulgar thinning of the lines for the seventeenth century letters are at least pure and simple in line the italian bodoni and the frenchman didot were the leaders in this luckless change though our own baskerville who was at work some years before them went much on the same lines but his letters though uninteresting and poor are not nearly so gross and vulgar as those of either the italian or the frenchman with this change the art of printing touched bottom so far as fine printing is concerned though paper did not get to its worst till about eighteen forty the chiswick press in eighteen forty four revived caslon's founts printing for messrs longman the diary of lady willoughby this experiment was so far successful that about eighteen fifty messrs miller and richard of edinburgh were induced to cut punches for a series of old-style letters these and similar founts cast by the above firm and others have now come into general use and are obviously a great improvement on the ordinary modern style in use in england which is in fact the bodoni type a little reduced in ugliness the design of the letters of this modern old style leaves a good deal to be desired and the whole effect is a little too gray owing to the thinness of the letters it must be remembered however that most modern printing is done by machinery on soft paper and not by the hand press and these somewhat wiry letters are suitable for the machine process which would not do justice to letters of more generous design it is discouraging to note that the improvement of the last fifty years is almost wholly confined to great britain here and there a book is printed in france or germany with some pretension to good taste but the general revival of the old forms 
has made no way in those countries. Italy is contentedly stagnant. America has produced a good many showy books, the typography, paper, and illustrations of which are, however, all wrong, oddity rather than rational beauty and meaning being apparently the thing sought for both in the letters and the illustrations. To say a few words on the principles of design and typography, it is obvious that legibility is the first thing to be aimed at in the forms of the letters. This is best furthered by the avoidance of irrational swellings and spiky projections, and by the using of careful purity of line. Even the Caslon type, when enlarged, shows great shortcomings in this respect. The ends of many of the letters, such as the T and E, are hooked up in a vulgar and meaningless way, instead of ending in the sharp and clear stroke of Jensen's letters. There is a grossness in the upper finishings of letters like the C, the A, and so on, an ugly pear-shaped swelling defacing the form of the letter. In short, it happens to this craft as to others that the utilitarian practice, though it professes to avoid ornament, still clings to a foolish, because misunderstood conventionality deduced from what was once ornament and is by no means useful which title can only be claimed by artistic practice, whether the art in it be conscious or unconscious. In no characters is the contrast between the ugly and vulgar illegibility of the modern type and the elegance and legibility of the ancient more striking than in the Arabic numerals. In the old print, each figure has its definite individuality, and one cannot be mistaken for the other. In reading the modern figures, the eyes must be strained before the reader can have any reasonable assurance that he has a five, an eight, or a three before him, unless the press work is of the best. This is awkward if you have to read Bradshaw's Guide in a hurry. One of the differences between the fine type and the utilitarian must probably be put down to a misapprehension of a commercial necessity this is the narrowing of the modern letters most of jensen's letters are designed within a square the modern letters are narrowed by a third or thereabout but while this gain of space very much hampers the possibility of beauty of design it is not a real gain for the modern printer throws the gain away by putting inordinately wide spaces between his lines which probably the lateral compression of his letters renders necessary. Commercialism again compels the use of type too small in size to be comfortable reading. The size known as long primer ought to be the smallest size used in a book meant to be read. Here again, if the practice of leading were retrenched, larger type could be used without enhancing the price of a book. One very important matter in setting up for fine printing is the spacing, that is, the lateral distance of words from one another. In good printing, the spaces between the words should be as near as possible equal. It is impossible that they should be quite equal except in lines of poetry. Modern printers understand this, but it is only practiced in the very best establishments. But another point which they should attend to they almost always disregard. This is the tendency to the formation of ugly, meandering white lines or rivers in the page, a blemish which can be nearly, though not wholly, avoided by care and forethought, the desirable thing being the breaking of the line, as in bonding masonry or brickwork. The general solidity of a page is much to be sought for. Modern printers generally overdo the whites in the spacing a defect probably forced on them by the characterless quality of the letters. For where these are boldly and carefully designed, and each letter is thoroughly individual in form, the words may be set much closer together without loss of clearness. No definite rules, however, except the avoidance of rivers and excess of white can be given for the spacing, which requires the constant exercise of judgment and taste on the part of the printer the position of the page on the paper 
should be considered if the book is to have a satisfactory look here once more the almost invariable modern practice is in opposition to a natural sense of proportion from the time when books first took their present shape till the end of the sixteenth century or indeed later the page so lay on the paper that there was more space allowed to the bottom and fore margin than to the top and back of the paper the unit of the book being looked on as the two pages forming an opening the modern printer in the teeth of the evidence given by his own eyes considers the single page as the unit and prints the page in the middle of his paper only nominally so however in many cases since when he uses a headline he counts that in the result as measured by the eye being that the lower margin is less than the top one and that the whole opening has an upside down look vertically and that laterally the page looks as if it were being driven off the paper the paper on which the printing is to be done is a necessary part of our subject of this it may be said that though there is some good paper made now it is never used except for very expensive books although it would not materially increase the cost in all but the very cheapest the paper that is used for ordinary books is exceedingly bad even in this country but is beaten in the race for vileness by that made in america which is the worst conceivable there seems to be no reason why ordinary paper should not be better made even allowing the necessity for a very low price but any improvement must be based on showing openly that the cheap article is cheap e g the cheap paper should not sacrifice toughness and durability to a smooth and white surface which should be indications of a delicacy of material and manufacture which would of necessity increase its cost one fruitful source of badness in paper is the habit that publishers have of eking out a thin volume by printing it on thick paper almost of the substance of cardboard a device which deceives nobody and makes a book very unpleasant to read on the whole a small book should be printed on paper which is as thin as may be without being transparent the paper used for printing the small highly ornamented french service books about the beginning of the sixteenth century is a model in this respect being thin tough and opaque however the fact must not be blinked that machine-made paper cannot in the nature of things be made of so good a texture as that made by hand the ornamentation of printed books is too wide a subject to be dealt with fully here but one thing must be said on it the essential point to be remembered is that the ornament whatever it is whether picture or pattern work should form part of the page should be a part of the whole scheme of the book simple as this proposition is it is necessary to be stated because the modern practice is to disregard the relation between the printing and the ornament altogether so that if the two are helpful to one another it is a mere matter of accident the due relation of letter to pictures and other ornament was thoroughly understood by the old printers so that even when the woodcuts are very rude indeed the proportions of the page still give pleasure by the sense of richness that the cuts and letter together convey when as is most often the case there is actual beauty in the cuts the books so ornamented are amongst the most delightful works of art that have ever been produced therefore granted well-designed type due spacing of the lines and words and proper position of the page on the paper all books might be at least comely and well-looking and if to these good qualities were added really beautiful ornament and pictures printed books might once again illustrate to the full the position of our society that a work of utility might be also a work of art if we cared to make it so end of section eleven recording by linda johnson section twelve of arts and crafts essays this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avaii in April 2017. Bookbinding by T. J. Copton Sanderson. Modern bookbinding dates from the application of printing to literature, and in essentials has remained unchanged to the present day, though in those outward characteristics, which appeal to the touch and to the eye, and constitute binding in the artistic sense, it has gone through many changes for better and for worse, which, in the opinion of the writer, have resulted in the main, in the exaggeration of technical skill, and in the death of artistic fancy. The first operation of the modern binder is to fold or refold the printed sheet into a section, and to gather the sections, numbered or lettered at the foot, in their proper order into a volume. The sections are then taken, one by one, placed face downwards in a frame, and sewn through the back by a continuous thread running backwards and forwards along the backs of the sections, to upright strings fastened at regular intervals in the sewing frame. This process unites the sections to one another in series one after the other, and permits the perusal of the book by the simple turning of leaf after leaf upon the hinge formed by the thread and the back of the section. A volume, or a series of sections, so treated, the ends of the string being properly secured, is essentially bound, all that is subsequently done is done for the protection or for the decoration of the volume or of its cover. The sides of a volume are protected by mill boards, called shortly boards. The boards themselves and the back are protected by a cover of leather, vellum, silk, linen or paper, wholly or in part. The edges of the volume are protected by the projection of the boards beyond them at top bottom and foredge, and usually by being cut smooth and gilt. A volume so bound and protected may be decorated by tooling, or otherwise, upon all the exposed surfaces, upon the edges, the sides, and the back, and may be designated by lettering upon the back or the sides. The degree in which a bound book is protected and decorated will determine the class to which the binding will belong. 1. In cloth binding, the cover, called a case, is made apart from the book, and is attached as a whole after the book is sewn. 2. In half binding, the cover is built up for and on each individual book, but the boards of which it is composed are only partly covered with the leather or other material which covers the back. 3. In whole binding, the boards are wholly covered with leather or other durable material, which in half binding covers only a portion of them. 4. In extra binding, whole binding is advanced a stage higher by decoration. Of course, in the various stages the details vary commensurately with the stage itself, being more or less elaborate as the stage is higher or lower in the scale. The process of extra binding set out in more detail is as follows. 1. First the sections are folded or refolded. 2. Then end papers, sections of plain paper added at the beginning and end of the volume to protect the first and last, the most exposed sections of printed matter constituting the volume proper, having been prepared and added, the sections are beaten, or rolled, or pressed, to make them solid. The end papers are usually added at a later stage, and are pasted on and not sewn, but, in the opinion of the writer, it is better to add them at this stage, and to sew them, and not to paste them. 3. Then the sections are sewn as already described. 4. When sewn, the volume passes into the hands of the forwarder, who, five, makes the back, beating it round, if the back is to be round, and backing it, or making it fan out from the centre to right and left, and project at the edges, 
to form a kind of ridge to receive and to protect the edges of the boards which form the sides of the cover. 6. The back having been made, the boards, made of millboard and originally of wood, for the protection of the sides, are made and cut to shape, and attached by lacing into them the ends of the strings upon which the book has been sewn. 7. The boards having been attached, the edges of the book are now cut smooth and even at the top, bottom, and fore-edge, the edges of the boards being used as guides for the purpose. In some cases the order is reversed, and the edges are first cut, and then the boards. 8. The edges may now be coloured and gilt, and, if it is proposed to gopher or to decorate them with tooling, they are so treated at this stage. 9. The headband is next worked on at head and tail, and the back lined with paper or leather or other material to keep the headband in its place and to strengthen the back itself. The book is now ready to be covered. 10. If the book is covered with leather, the leather is carefully paired all round the edges and along the line of the back, to make the edges sharp and the joints free. 11. The book having been covered, the depression on the inside of the boards caused by the overlap of the leather is filled in with paper, so that the entire inner surface may be smooth and even, and ready to receive the first and last leaves of the end papers, which finally are cut to shape and pasted down, leaving the borders only uncovered. Sometimes, however, the first and last leaves of the end papers are of silk and the joint of leather, in which case, of course, the end papers are not pasted down, but the insides of the boards are independently treated and are covered, sometimes with leather, sometimes with silk or other material. The book is now forwarded and passes into the hands of the finisher to be tooled or decorated, or finished, as it is called. The decoration in gold on the surface of leather is wrought out, bit by bit, by means of small brass stamps called tools. The steps of the process are shortly as follows. 12. The pattern having been settled and worked out on paper, it is transferred to, or marked out on, the various surfaces to which it is to be applied. Each surface is then prepared in succession, and, if large, bit by bit, to receive the gold. 13. First the leather is washed with water or with vinegar. 14. Then the pattern is penciled over with glare, white of egg beaten up and drained off, or the surface is wholly washed with it. 15. Next it is smeared lightly with grease or oil. 16. And finally the gold, gold leaf, is applied by a pad of cotton wool or a flat tin brush called a tip. 17. The pattern, visible through the gold, is now re-impressed or worked with the tools heated to about the temperature of boiling water, and the unimpressed or waste gold is removed by an oil drag, leaving the pattern in gold and the rest of the leather clear. These several operations are, in England, usually distributed among five classes of persons. 1. The superintendent, or person responsible for the whole work. 2. The sewer, usually a woman, who folds, sews, and makes the headbands. 3. The book edge gilder, who gilds the edges, usually a craft apart. 4. The forwarder, who performs all the other operations leading up to the finishing. 5. The finisher, who decorates and letters the volume after it is forwarded. In Paris the work is still further distributed, a special workman, couvreur, being employed to prepare the leather for covering and to cover. In the opinion of the writer, the work, as a craft of beauty, suffers, as do the workmen, from the allocation of different operations to different workmen. 
the work should be conceived of as one and be wholly executed by one person or at most by two and especially should there be no distinction between finisher and forwarder between executant and artist the following technical terms may serve to call attention to the principal features of a bound book one the back the posterior edge of the volume upon which at the present time the title is usually placed formerly it was placed on the fore edge or side the back may be a convex or concave or flat b marked horizontally with bands or smooth from head to tail c tight the leather or other covering adhering to the back itself or hollow the leather or other covering not so adhering and d stiff or flexible two edges the three other edges of the book the top the bottom and the foredge three bands the cords upon which the book is sewn and which if not let in or embedded in the back appear on it as parallel ridges the ridges are however usually artificial the real bands being let in to facilitate the sewing and their places supplied by thin slips of leather cut to resemble them and glued on the back this process also enables the foreworder to give great sharpness and finish to this part of his work if he think it worth while four between bands the space between the bands five head and tail the top and bottom of the back six the headband and head cap the fillet of silk worked in buttonhole stitch at the head and tail and the cap or cover of leather over it the headband had its origin probably in the desire to strengthen the back and to resist the strain when a book is pulled by head or tail from the shelf seven boards the sides of the cover stiff or limp thick or thin in all degrees eight squares the projection of the boards beyond the edges of the book these may be shallow or deep in all degrees limited only by the purpose they have to fulfil and the danger they will themselves be exposed to if too deep nine borders the overlaps of leather on the insides of the boards ten proof the rough edges of leaves left uncut in cutting the edges to show where the original margin was and to prove that the cutting has not been too severe the life of bookbinding is in the dainty mutation of its mutable elements back bands boards squares decoration these elements admit of almost endless variation singly and in combination in kind and in degree in fact however they are now almost always uniformly treated or worked up to one type or set of types this is the death of bookbinding as a craft of beauty the finish moreover or execution has outrun invention and is the great characteristic of modern bookbinding this again the inversion of the due order is in the opinion of the writer but as the carving on the tomb of a dead art and itself dead a well-bound beautiful book is neither of one type nor finished so that its highest praise is that had it been made by a machine it could not have been made better it is individual it is instinct with the hand of him who made it it is pleasant to feel to handle and to see it is the original work of an original mind working in freedom simultaneously with hand and heart and brain to produce a thing of use which all time shall agree ever more and more also to call a thing of beauty t j copton sanderson end of section 12《セクション thirteen of Arts and Crafts Essays》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
of mural painting by f maddox brown there seems no precise reason why the subject of this note should differ much from that of mr crane's article on decorative painting pages thirty nine to fifty one mural painting need not as such consist of any one sort of painting more than another decorative painting does seem on the other hand to indicate a certain desire or undertaking to render the object painted more pleasant to the beholder's eye from long habit however chiefly induced by the constant practice of the italians of modern times mural painting has come to be looked upon as figure painting in fact the human figure exclusively on walls and no other sort of objects can sufficiently impart that dignity to a building which it seems to crave for i can think of no valid reason why a set of rooms or walls should not be decorated with animals in lieu of humans as the late mr trelawney used to call us one wall to be devoted to monkeys a second to be filled in with tigers a third to be given up to horses etc etc i know men in england and i believe some artists who would be delighted with the substitution but i hope the general sense of the public would be set against such subjects and the lowering effects of them on every one and the kind of humiliation we should feel at knowing them to exist i have been informed that in berlin the walls of the rooms where the antique statues are kept have been painted with mixed subjects representing antique buildings with antique greek views and landscapes to back up as it were the statues i must own it that without having seen the decoration in question i feel filled with extreme aversion for the plan the more so when one considers the extreme unlikelihood of the same being made tolerable in colour at berlin i have also been told that some painters in the north of england bitten with a desire to decorate buildings have painted one set of rooms with landscapes this without the least knowledge of the works in question as landscapes i must allow i regret there is it seems to me an unbridgeable chasm not to be passed between landscape art and the decoration of walls for the very essence of the landscape art is distance whereas the very essence of the wall picture is its solidity or at least its not appearing to be a hole in the wall on the matter of subjects fit for painting on walls i may have a few words to say farther on in this paper but first i had better set down what little i have to advise with regard to the material and mode of executing the old-fashioned italian or buon fresco i look upon as practically given up in this country and every other european country that has not a climate to equal italy if the climate of paris will not admit of this process how much less is our damp foggy changeable atmosphere likely to put up with it for many years it is true that the frescoes of william dice have lasted for some thirty years without apparent damage but also it is the case that the queen's robing rooms in the house of lords have been specially guarded against atmospheric changes of temperature next to real fresco there has been in repute for a time the water-glass process in which daniel maclise's great paintings have been executed i see no precise reason why these noble works should not last and defy climate for many many long years yet though from want of experience he very much endangered this durability through the too lavish application of the medium but in germany the country of water-glass the process is already in bad repute the third alternative spirit fresco or what we in england claim as the gambier perry process has i understand superseded it i have myself painted in this system seven works on the walls of the manchester town hall and have had no reason to complain of their behaviour since beginning the series however a fresh change has come over the fortunes of mural art in the fact that in france what most strongly recommends itself to common sense the mural painters have now taken to painting on canvas which is afterwards cemented or what the french call maronflé on to the wall white lead and oil with a very small admixture of rosin melted in oil are the ingredients used it is laid on cold and plentifully on the wall and on the back of the picture and the painting pressed down with a cloth or handkerchief nothing further being required saving to guard the edges of the canvas from curling up before the white lead has had time to harden the advantage of this process of cementing lies in the fact that with each succeeding year it must become harder and more like stone in its consistency the canvases may be prepared as if for oil painting and painted with common oil colours flatted or matted afterwards by gum elemy and spike oil or the canvas may be prepared with the gambier perry colour and painted in that very matte medium 
the canvases should if possible be fine in texture as better adapted for adhering to the wall the advantage of this process is that should at any time through neglect damp invade the wall and the canvas show a tendency to get loose it would be easy to replace it or the canvas might be altogether detached from the wall and strained as a picture i must now return to the choice of subject a matter of much importance but on which it is difficult to give advice one thing however may be urged as a rule and that is that very dark or rembrandt-esque subjects are particularly unsuited for mural paintings i cannot go into the reasons for this but a slight experiment ought to satisfy the painter having once heard the principle enunciated that is if he belong to the class likely to succeed at such work another sine qua non as to subject is that the painter himself must be allowed to select it it is true that certain limitations may be accorded for instance the artist may be required to select a subject with certain tendencies in it but the actual invention of the subject and working out of it must be his in fact the painter himself is the only judge of what he is likely to carry out well and of the subjects that are paintable then much depends on whom the works are for if for the general public and carried out with their money care it seems to me but fair should be taken that the subjects are such as they can understand and take interest in if on the contrary you are painting for highly cultured people with a turn for greek myths it is quite another thing then such a subject as eros reproaching his brother anteros for his coldness might be one offering opportunities for shades of sentiment suited to the givers of the commissions concerned but for such as have not been trained to entertain these refinements downright facts either in history or in sociology are calculated most to excite the imagination it is not always necessary for the spectator to be exact in his conclusions i remember once at manchester the member of a young men's christian association had come to a meeting in the great hall some of them were there too soon and so were looking around the room one observed what's this about his friend answered fallen off a ladder the police are running him in well this was not quite correct a wounded young danish chieftain was being hurried out of manchester on his comrade's shoulders with a view to save his life the phrygian helmets of the danes indicated neither firemen nor policemen but the idea was one of misfortune and care bestowed on it and did as well and showed sympathy in a somewhat uncultivated though well-intentioned class of lancastrians on the other hand i have noticed that subjects that interest infallibly all classes educated or illiterate are religious subjects it is not a question of piety but comes from the simple breadth of poetry and humanity usually involved in this class of subject that the amount of religiosity in either spectator or producer has nothing to do with the feeling is clear if we consider the spaniards are one of the most religious peoples ever known and yet their art is singularly deficient in this quality were there ever two greater painters as wanting in the sacred feeling as velasquez and murillo and yet in all probability they were more religious than ourselves it only remains for me to point to the fact that mural painting when it has been practised jointly by those who were at the same time easel painters has invariably raised those painters to far higher flights and instances of style than they seem capable of in the smaller path take the examples left us say by raphael and michelangelo or some of the earlier masters such as the fulminati of signorelli compared with his specimens in our national gallery or the works left on walls by even less favoured artists such as domenichino and andrea del sarto or the french de la roche's hemicycle or our own great painters dice and maclise's frescoes the same rise in style the same improvement is everywhere to be noticed both in drawing in colour and in flesh painting F. Maddox Brown. End of section thirteen. Section fourteen of Arts and Crafts Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Of Sgraffito Work by Haywood Sumner. The Italian words graffiato, sgraffiato, or scraffito mean scratched, and scratched work is the oldest form of graphic expression and surface decoration used by man. The term sgraffito is, however, specially used to denote decoration scratched or incised upon plaster 
or potter's clay while still soft and for beauty of effect depends either solely upon lines thus incised according to design with the resulting contrast of surfaces or partly upon such lines and contrast and partly upon an undercoat of color revealed by the incisions while again the means at disposal may be increased by varying the colors of the undercoat in accordance with the design of the potter's scrafito i have no experience but it is my present purpose briefly and practically to examine the method special aptitudes and limitations of polychrome scrafito as applied to the plasterer's craft first then as to method given the wall intended to be treated granted the completion of the scheme of decoration the cartoons having been executed in several colors and the outlines firmly pricked and further all things being ready for beginning work hack off any existing plaster from the wall when bare rake and sweep out the joints thoroughly when clean give the wall as much water as it will drink lay the coarse coat leaving the face rough in order to make a good key for the next coat when sufficiently set fix your cartoon in its destined position with slate nails pounce through the pricked outlines remove the cartoon replace the nails in the register holes mark in with a brush in white oil paint the spaces for the different colors as shown in the cartoon and pounced in outline on the coarse coat placing the letters b r y etc as the case may be in order to show the plasterer where to lay the different colors black red yellow etc give the wall as much water as it will drink lay the color coat in accordance with the lettered spaces on the coarse coat taking care not to displace the register nails and leaving plenty of key for the final surface coat in laying the color coat calculate how much of the color surface it may be advisable to get on the wall as the same duration of time should be maintained throughout the work between the laying of the color coat and the following on with the final surface coat for this reason if the color coat sets hard before the final coat is laid it will not be possible to scrape up the color to its full strength wherever it may be revealed by incision of the design when sufficiently set i e in about twenty four hours follow on with the final surface coat only laying as much as can be cut and cleaned up in a day when this is sufficiently steady fix up the cartoon in its registered position pounce through the pricked outlines remove the cartoon and cut the design in the surface coat before it sets then if your register is correct you will cut through to different colors according to the design and in the course of a few days the work should set as hard and homogeneous as stone and as damp proof as the nature of things permits the three coats above referred to may be gauged as follows coarse coat two or three of sharp clean sand to one of portland to be laid about three-quarter inch in thickness this coat is to promote an even suction and to keep back damp color coat one of color to one and a half of old portland to be laid about one-eighth inch in thickness specially prepared distemper colors should be used and amongst such may be mentioned golden ochre turkey red indian red manganese black lime blue and umber final surface coat aberthal lime and selenitic cement both sifted through a fine sieve the proportions of the gauge depend upon the heat of the lime or parian cement sifted as above air slaked for twenty four hours and gauged with water colored with ochre so as to give a creamy tone when the plaster dries out or three of selenitic cement to two of silver sand both sifted as above this may be used for outdoor work individual taste and experience must decide as to the thickness of the final coat but if laid between one eighth inch and one twelfth inch and the lines cut with slanting edges a side light gives emphasis to the finished result making the outlines tell alternately 
as they take the light or cast a shadow plasterers small tools of various kinds and knife blades fixed in tool handles will be found suited to the simple craft of cutting and clearing off the final surface coat but as to this a craftsman finds his own tools by experience and indeed by the same acquired perception must be interpreted all the foregoing directions and specially that ambiguous word dear to the writers of recipes sufficient thus far method now as to special aptitudes and limitations sgraffito work may claim a special aptitude for design whose center of aim is line it has no beauty of material like glass no mystery of surface like mosaic no preeminence of subtly woven tone and color like tapestry yet it gives freer play to line than any of these mentioned fields of design and a cartoon for sgraffito can be executed in facsimile undeviated by warp and woof and unchecked by angular tesserae or lead lines true hardness of design may easily result from this aptitude indeed is to a certain extent inherent to the method under examination but in overcoming this danger and in making the most of this aptitude is the artist discovered sgraffito from its very nature asserts the wall that is preserves the solid appearance of the building which it is intended to decorate the decoration is in the wall rather than on the wall it seems to be organic the inner surface of the actual wall changes color in puzzling but orderly sequence as the upper surface passes into expressive lines and spaces delivers its simple message and then relapses into silence but whether incised with intricate design or left in plain relieving spaces the wall receives no further treatment the marks of float trowel and scraper remain and combine to make a natural surface it compels the work to be executed in situ the studio must be exchanged for the scaffold and the result should justify the inconvenience however carefully the scheme of decoration may be designed slight yet important modifications and readjustments will probably be found necessary in the transfer from cartoon to wall and though the ascent of the scaffold may seem an indignity to those who prefer to suffer vicariously in the execution of their works and though we of the nineteenth know as cennini of the fifteenth century knew that painting pictures is the proper employment of a gentleman and with velvet on his back he may paint what he pleases still the fact remains that if decoration is to attain that inevitable fitness for its place which is the fulfillment of design this proper employment of a gentleman must be postponed and velvet exchanged for blouse it compels a quick sure manner of work and this quickness of execution due to the setting nature of the final coat and to the consequent necessity of working against time gives an appearance of strenuous ease to the firm incisions and spaces by which the design is expressed and a living energy of line to the whole again the setting nature of the color coat suggests and naturally lends itself to an occasional addition in the shape of mosaic to the means at disposal and a little glitter here and there will be found to go a long way in giving points of emphasis and play to large surfaces it compels the artist to adopt a limited color scheme a limitation and yet one which may almost be welcomed as an aptitude for of colors in decorative work multiplication may be said to be a vexation finally the limitations of sgraffito as a method of expression are the same as those of all incised or line work by it you can express ideas and suggest life but you cannot realize cannot imitate the natural objects on which your graphic language is founded the means at disposal are too scanty item white lines and spaces relieved against and slightly raised on a colored ground colored lines and spaces slightly sunk on a white surface 
intricacy relieved by simplicity of line and again either relieved by plain spaces of colored ground or white surface indeed they are simple means yet line still remains the readiest manner of graphic expression and if in the strength of limitation our past masters of the arts and crafts have had power to free arouse dilate by their simple record of hand and soul we also should be able to bring forth new achievement from old method and to suggest the life and express the ideas which sway the latter years of our own century end of section fourteen recording by linda johnson section fifteen of arts and crafts essays this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. of stucco and gesso by g t robinson few things are more disheartening to the pursuer of plastic art than finding that when he has carried his own labor to a certain point he has to entrust it to another in order to render it permanent and useful if he models in clay and wishes it burnt into terracotta the shrinkage and risk in firing and the danger in transport to the kiln are a nightmare to him if he wishes it cast in plaster the distortion by waste moulding or the cost of piece moulding are serious grievances to him considering that after all he has but a friable result and though this latter objection is minimized by mrs laxton clark's ingenious process of indurating plaster yet i am persuaded that most modellers would prefer to complete their work in some permanent form with their own hands having this desirable end in view i wish to draw their attention to some disused processes which once largely prevailed by which the artist is enabled to finish and render durable and vendable his work without having to part with it or pay for another's aid these old processes are modeling in stucco duro and gesso stucco duro although of very ancient practice is now practically a lost art the materials required are simply well burnt and slacked lime a little fine sand and some finely ground unburnt limestone or white marble dust these are well tempered together with water and beaten up with sticks until a good workable paste results in fact the preparation of the materials is exactly the same as that described by vitruvius who recommends that the fragments of marble be sifted into three degrees of fineness using the coarser for the rough bossage the medium for the general modeling and the finest for the surface finish after which it can be polished with chalk and powdered lime if necessary indeed to so fine a surface can this material be brought and so highly can it be polished that he mentions its use for mirrors the only caution that is needful to give is to avoid working too quickly for as sir henry wooten king james's ambassador at venice who greatly advocated the use of stucco duro observed the stucco worker makes his figures by addition and the carver by subtraction and to avoid too great risk of the work cracking and drying these additions must be made slowly where the relief is great if the relief is very great or if a figure of large dimensions is essayed it may be needful even to delay the drying of the stucco and the addition of a little stiff paste will ensure this so that the work may be consecutively worked upon for many days from the remains of the stucco work of classic times left us we can realize how perfectly workable this material was and if you examine the plaster casts taken from some most delicate low-relief plaques in stucco exhumed some ten years ago near the villa farnesina at rome or the rougher and readier fragments of stucco duro itself from some italo-greek tombs both of which are to be seen in the south kensington museum you will at once be convinced of the great applicability of the process with the decadence of classic art some portion of the process seems to have been lost 
and the use of pounded travertine was substituted for white marble but as the bassi relievi of the early renaissance were mostly decorated with color this was not important the ground colors seemed generally to have been laid on whilst the stucco was wet as in fresco and the details heightened with tempera or encaustic colors sometimes with accessories enriched in gilt gesso of which hereafter many remains of these exist and in the nineteenth winter exhibition of the royal academy there were no less than twelve very interesting examples of it exhibited and in the south kensington museum are some few moderately good illustrations of it it was not however until the sixteenth century that the old means of producing the highly finished white stucci were rediscovered and this revival of the art as an architectonic accessory is due to the exhumation of the baths of titus under leo the tenth raphael and giovanni da udine were then so struck with the beauty of the stucco work thus exposed to view that its reuse was at once determined upon and the loggia of the vatican was the first result of many experiments though the reinvented process seems to have been precisely that described by vitruvius naturally the art of modeling in stucco at once became popular the patronage of it by the pope and the practice of it by the artists who worked for him gave it the highest sanction and hardly a building of any architectural importance was erected in italy during the sixteenth century that did not bear evidence of the artistic craft of the stuccatori there has just autumn eighteen eighty nine arrived at the south kensington museum a model of the central hall of the villa madama in rome thus decorated by giulio romano and giovanni da udine which exemplifies the adaptability of the process and in this model cavaliere mariani has employed stucco duro for its execution showing to how high a pitch of finish this material is capable of being carried indeed it was used by goldsmiths for the models of their craft as being less liable to injury than wax yet capable of receiving equally delicate treatment and benvenuto cellini modelled the celebrated button with that magnificent big diamond in the middle for the cope of pope clement with all its intricate detail in this material how minute this work of some six inches diameter was may be inferred from cellini's own description of it above the diamond in the centre of the piece was shown god the father seated in the act of giving the benediction below were three children who with their arms upraised were supporting the jewel one of them in the middle was in full relief the other two in half relief all round i set a crowd of cherubs in divers attitudes a mantle undulated to the wind around the figure of the father from the folds of which cherubs peeped out and there were many other ornaments besides which adds he and for once we may believe him made a very beautiful effect at the same time figures larger than life indeed colossal figures were executed in it and in our own country the italian artists brought over by our henry the eighth worked in that style for his vanished palace of nonsuch gradually stucco duro fell into disuse and coarse pargetry and mottled plaster ceilings became in later years its sole and degenerate descendants gesso is really a painter's art rather than a sculptor's and consists in impasto painting with a mixture of plaster of paris or whiting in glue the composition with which the ground of his pictures is laid after roughly modeling the higher forms with tow or some fibrous material incorporated with the gesso but it is questionable if gesso is the best vehicle for any but the lowest relief by it the most subtle and delicate variation of surface can be obtained and the finest lines penciled analogous in fact to the fine pot sur pot work in porcelain its chief use in early times was in the accessories of painting as the nimby attributes and jewelry of the personage represented and it was almost entirely used as a groundwork for gilding upon 
abundant illustration of this usage will be found in the pictures by the early italian masters in the national gallery the retables of altars were largely decorated in this material a notable example being that still existing in westminster abbey many of the gorgeous accessories to the panoply of war in medieval times such as decorative shields and the lighter military accoutrements were thus ornamented in low relief and on the high cruppered and high peaked saddles it was abundantly displayed in the sixteenth century work of germany it seems to have received an admixture of finely pounded lithographic stone or hone stone by which it became of such hardness as to be taken for sculpture in these materials its chief use however was for the decoration of the caskets and ornamental objects which make up the refinement of domestic life and the base representative of it which figures on our picture frames claims a noble ancestry its tenacity when well prepared is exceedingly great and i have used it on glass on polished marble on porcelain and such like non-absorbent surfaces from which it can scarcely be separated without destruction of its base indeed for miniature art gesso possesses innumerable advantages not presented by any other medium but it is hardly available for larger works time and space will not permit my entering more fully into these two forms of plastic art but seeing that we are annually receiving such large accessions to the numbers of our modelers and as of course it is not possible for all these to achieve success in or find a means of living by the art of sculpture in marble i have sought to indicate a home art means by which at very moderate cost they can bring their labors in useful form before the world and at the same time learn and live End of section 15. Recording by Linda Johnson. Section 16 of Arts and Crafts Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Of Cast Iron. W. R. Letheby cast iron is nearly our humblest material and with associations less than all artistic for it has been almost hopelessly vulgarized in the present century so much so that mr ruskin with his fearless use of paradox to shock one into thought has laid it down that cast iron is an artistic solecism impossible for architectural service now or at any time and yet although we can never claim for iron the beauty of bronze it is in some degree a parallel material and has been used with appreciation in many ways up to the beginning of this century iron was already known in sussex at the coming of the romans throughout this county and kent in out-of-the-way farmhouses iron firebacks to open hearths fine specimens of the founder's art are still in daily use as they have been for three hundred years or more some have gothic diapers and meanders of vine with heraldic badges and initials and are evidently cast from models made in the fifteenth century patterns that remained in stock and were cast from again and again others of the following centuries have coat arms and supporters salamanders in the flames figures a triton or centaur or even a scene the judgment of solomon or marriage of alexander or more appropriately mere pattern work vases of flowers and the like however crude they may be and some are absurdly inadequate as sculpture the sense of treatment and relief suitable to the material never fails to give them a fit interest with these backs cast iron fire dogs are often found of which some gothic examples also remain simple in form with soft dull modelling later these were often a mere obelisk on a base surmounted by a ball or a bird or rude terminal figures 
sometimes a more delicate full figure the limbs well together so that nothing projects from the general post-like form and within their limitations they are not without grace and character in frant church near tombridge are several cast-iron grave slabs about six feet long by half that width perfectly flat one with a single shield of arms and some letters others with several they are quite successful natural and not in the least vulgar iron railings are the most usual form of cast iron as an accessory to architecture the early examples of these in london are thoroughly fit for their purpose and their material sturdily simple forms of gently swelling curves or with slightly rounded reliefs the original railing at st paul's of lamberhurst iron is the finest of these a large portion of which around the west front was removed in eighteen seventy three another example encloses the portico of st martin's in the fields the railing of the central area of berkeley square is beautifully designed and there are instances here as in grosvenor square where cast iron is used together with wrought a difficult combination balcony railings and staircase balustrades are quite general to houses of the late eighteenth century refined and thoroughly good of their kind they never fail to please and never of course imitate wrought iron the design is always direct unpretentious and effortless in a manner that became at this time quite a tradition the verandas also of which there are so many in piccadilly or mayfair with posts reeded and of delicate profiles are of the same kind confessedly cast iron and never without the characterizing dullness of the forms so that they have no jutting members to be broken off to expose a repulsive jagged fracture the opposite of all these qualities may be found in the expensive-looking railing on the embankment enclosing the gardens whose tiny fretted and fretful forms invite an experiment often successful it must be understood that cast iron should be merely a flat lattice-like design obviously cast in panels or plain post and rail construction with cast uprights and terminal knobs tenoned into rails so that there is no doubt of straightforward unaffected fitting the british museum screen may be taken to instance how ample ability will not redeem false principles of design the construction is not clear nor are the forms sufficiently simple the result being only a high order of commonplace grandeur even the lamp-posts set up in the beginning of the century for oil lights a few of which have not yet been improved away from back streets show the same care for appropriate form some of the pall mall clubs again have well-designed candelabra of a more pretentious kind also london and waterloo bridges the fire grates both with hobs and close fronts that came into use about the middle of the last century are decorated all over the field with tiny flutings beads and leaf mouldings sometimes even with little figure medallions and carry delicacy to its limit the better examples are entirely successful both in form and in the ornamentation which adapted to this new purpose does no more than gracefully acknowledge its debt to the past just as the best ornament at all times is neither original nor copied it must recognize tradition and add something which shall be the tradition of the future the method followed is to keep the general form quite simple and the areas flat while the decoration just an embroidery of the surface is one of substance and in the slightest possible relief other larger grates there were with plain surfaces simply framed with mouldings even the sculptor has not refused iron pliny says there were two statues in rhodes one of iron and copper 
and the other a hercules entirely of iron in the palace at prague there is a st george horston armed the work of the fourteenth century the qualities natural to iron which it has to offer for sculpture may best be appreciated by seeing the examples at the museum of geology in german street on the staircase there are two large dogs two ornamental candelabra and two figures the dogs although not fine as sculpture are well treated in mass and surface for the metal in the same museum there is a small statue still better for surface and finish a french work signed and dated eighteen forty one and therefore half an antique but for ordinary foundry work without surface finish probably the most appropriate certainly the most available method the little lions on the outer rail at the british museum are proof of how sufficient feeling for design will dignify any material for any object they are by the late alfred stevens and are thoroughly iron beasts so slightly modelled that they would be only blocked out for bronze in the geological museum are also specimens of berlin and ilsenburg manufacture they serve to point the moral that ingenuity is not art nor tenuity refinement the question of rust is a difficult one the oxide not being an added beauty like the patina acquired by bronze yet the decay of cast iron is much less than is generally thought especially on large smooth surfaces if the casting has been once treated by an oil bath or a coating of hot tar the celebrated iron pillar of delhi some twenty feet high has stood for fourteen centuries and shows it is said little evidence of decay it would be interesting to see how cast spheres of good iron would be affected in our climate if occasionally coated with a lacquer in painting the range of tints best approved is black through gray to white the simple negative gray gives a pleasant unobtrusiveness to the well-designed ironwork of the northern station in paris whereas our almost universal indian red is a very bad choice a hot coarse color you must see it and be irritated and it is surely the only color that gets worse as it bleaches in the sun gilding is suitable to a certain extent but for internal work the homely black leading cannot be bettered to put together the results obtained in our examination of examples one the metal must be both good and carefully manipulated two the design must be thought out through the material and its traditional methods three the pattern must have the ornament modelled not carved as is almost universally the case now carving in wood being entirely unfit to give the soft suggestive relief required both by the nature of the sand mould into which it is impressed and the crystalline structure of the metal when cast four flat surfaces like great fronts may be decorated with some intricacy if the relief is delicate but the relief must be less than the basis of attachment so that the moulding may be easily practicable and no portions invite one to test how easily they might be detached five objects in the round must have a simple and substantial bounding form with but little ornament and that only suggested this applies equally to figures in them homogeneous structure is of the first importance six when possible the surface should be finished and left as a metal casting it may however be entirely gilt if painted the color must be neutral and gray casting in iron has been so abased and abused that it is almost difficult to believe that the metal has anything to offer to the arts at no other time in no other country would a national staple commodity have been so degraded yet in its strength under pressure but fragility to a blow in certain qualities of texture and of required manipulation it invites a specially characterized treatment in the design and it offers one of the few materials 
naturally black available in the color arrangement of interiors w r lethaby end of section sixteen Section 17 of Arts and Crafts Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Julie Barclay. Of Dying as an Art by William Morris. Dying is a very ancient art. From the earliest times of the ancient civilizations till within about forty years ago, there had been no essential change in it and not much change of any kind. Up to the time of the discovery of the process of Prussian blue dyeing in about 1810, it was known as a pigment thirty or forty years earlier, the only changes in the art were the result of the introduction of the American insect dye, cochineal, which gradually superseded the European one, kermes, and the American wood dyes now known as logwood and brazilwood, the latter differs little from the Asiatic and African red saunders, and other red dye woods. The former has cheapened and worsened black dyeing, in so far as it has taken the place of the indigo vat as a basis. The American quercitron bark gives us also a useful additional yellow dye. These changes, and one or two others, however, did little towards revolutionizing the art. That revolution was left for our own days and resulted from the discovery of what are known as the aniline dyes, deduced by a long process from the plants of the coal measures. Of these dyes, it must be enough to say that their discovery, while conferring the greatest honor on the abstract science of chemistry, and while doing great service to capitalists in their hunt after profits, has terribly injured the art of dyeing, and for the general public has nearly destroyed it as an art. Henceforward there is an absolute divorce between the commercial process and the art of dyeing. Anyone wanting to produce dyed textiles with any artistic quality in them must entirely forego the modern and commercial methods in favor of those which are at least as old as Pliny, who speaks of them as being old in his time. Now, in order to dye textiles in patterns or otherwise, we need four colors to start with, to wit, blue, red, yellow, and brown. Green, purple, black, and all intermediate shades can be made from a mixture of these colors. Blue is given us by indigo and woad, which do not differ in color in the least, their chemical product being the same. Woad may be called northern indigo, and indigo tropical or subtropical woad. Note that until the introduction of Prussian blue about 1810, there was no other blue dye except this indigotine, which could be called a dye. The other blue dyes were mere stains which would not bear the sun for more than a few days. Red is yielded by the insect dyes kermes, lac dye, and cochineal, and by the vegetable dye matter. Of these, kermes is the king, brighter than matter and at once more permanent and more beautiful than cochineal. The latter on an aluminous basis gives a rather cold crimson, and on a tin basis a rather hot scarlet. For example, the dress coat of a line officer. Matter yields on wool a deep-toned blood red, somewhat bricky and tending to scarlet. On cotton and linen, all imaginable shades of red according to the process. It is not of much use in dyeing silk, which it is apt to blind, i.e., it takes off the gloss. Lac dye gives a hot and not pleasant scarlet, as may be noted in a private militiaman's coat. The French liner's trousers, by the way, are, or were, dyed with matter, so that their countrymen sometimes call them matter-wearers, but their cloth is somewhat too cheaply dyed to do credit to the dry saltery. Besides these permanent red dyes, there are others produced from woods, called in the Middle Ages by their general name of Brazil, whence the name of the American country, because the conquerors found so much dyeing wood growing there. Some of these wood dyes are very beautiful in color, but unluckily they are none of them permanent, as you may see by examining the beautiful stuffs of the 13th and 14th centuries at the South Kensington Museum, in which you will scarcely find any red, but plenty of fawn color, which is in fact the wood red of 500 years ago thus faded. If you turn from them to the Gothic tapestries, and note the reds in them, you will have the measure of the relative permanence of Kermes red and Brazil. 
the tapestry reds being all dyed with kermes and still retaining the greater part of their color the medieval dyers must be partly excused however because brazil is especially a silk dye kermes sharing somewhat in the ill qualities of matter for silk though i have dyed silk in kermes and got very beautiful and powerful colors by means of it yellow dyes are chiefly given us by weld sometimes called wild mignonette quercitron bark mentioned above and old fustic an american dye wood of these weld is much the prettiest and is the yellow silk dye par excellence though it dyes wool well enough but yellow dyes are the commonest to be met with in nature and our fields and hedgerows bear plenty of greening weeds as our forefathers called them since they used them chiefly for greening blue woolen cloth for as you may well believe they being good colorists had no great taste for yellow woolen stuff dyer's broom sawwort the twigs of the poplar the osier and the birch heather broom flowers and twigs will all of them give yellows of more or less permanence of these i have tried poplar and osier twigs which both gave a strong yellow but the former not a very permanent one speaking generally yellow dyes are the least permanent of all as once more you may see by looking at an old tapestry in which the greens have always faded more than the reds or blues the best yellow dyes however lose only their brighter shade the lemon color and leave a residuum of brownish yellow which still makes a kind of green over the blue brown is best got from the roots of the walnut tree or in their default from the green husks of the nuts this material is especially best for saddening as the old dyers used to call it the best and most enduring blacks were also done with this simple dye stuff the goods being first dyed in the indigo or woad vat till they were a very dark blue and then browned into black by means of the walnut root catechu the inspissated juice of a plant or plants which comes to us from india also gives rich and useful permanent browns of various shades green is obtained by dyeing a blue of the required shade in the indigo vat and then greening it with a good yellow dye adding what else may be necessary as for example matter to modify the color according to taste purple is got by bluing in the indigo vat and afterwards by a bath of cochineal or kermes or matter all intermediate shades of claret and murray and russet can be got by these drugs helped out by saddening black as aforesaid is best made by dyeing dark blue wool with brown and walnut is better than iron for the brown part because the iron brown is apt to rot the fibre as once more you will see in some pieces of old tapestry or old persian carpets where the black is quite perished or at least in the case of the carpet gone down to the knots all intermediate shades can as aforesaid be got by blending of these prime colours or by using weak baths of them for instance all shades of flesh colour can be got by means of weak baths of madder and walnut saddening madder or cochineal mixed with weld gives us orange and with saddening all imaginable shades between yellow and red including the ambers maize colour etc the crimsons in gothic tapestries must have been got by dyeing kermes over pale shades of blue since the crimson red dye cochineal had not yet come to europe a word or two entirely unscientific about the process of this old-fashioned or artistic dyeing in the first place all dyes must be soluble colors differing in this respect from pigments most of which are insoluble and are only very finely divided as for example ultramarine umber terre verte next dyes may be divided into those which need a mordant and those which do not or as the old chemist bancroft very conveniently expresses it into adjective and substantive dyes indigo is the great substantive dye indigo has to be deoxidized and thereby made soluble in which state it loses its blue color in proportion as the solution is complete the goods are plunged into this solution and worked in it between two waters as the phrase goes and when exposed to the air the indigo they have got on them is swiftly oxidized and once more becomes insoluble the process is repeated till the required shade is got all shades of blue can be got by this means from the pale watchet as our forefathers called it up to the blue which the eighteenth century french dyers called bleu d'enfer navy blue is the politer name for it today in england 
I must add that, though this seems an easy process, the setting of the blue vat is a ticklish job, and requires, I should say, more experience than any other dyeing process. The brown dyes, walnut and katechu, need no mordant, and are substantive dyes. Some of the yellows can also be dyed without mordant, but are much improved by it. The red dyes, kermes and madder, and the yellow dye weld are especially mordant or adjective dyes. They are all dyed on an aluminous basis. To put the matter plainly, the goods are worked in a solution of alum, usually with a little acid added, and after an interval of a day or two, aging, are dyed in a bath of the dissolved dye stuff. A lake is thus formed on the fibre, which is in most cases very durable. The effect of this mordanting of the fibre is clearest seen in the mattering of printed cotton goods, which are first printed with aluminous mordants of various degrees of strength, or with iron if black is needed, or a mixture of iron with alumina for purple, and then dyed wholesale in the matterbeck. The result being that the parts which have been mordanted come out various shades of red, etc., according to the strength or composition of the mordant, while the unmordanted parts remain a dirty pink, which has to be cleared into white by soaping and exposure to the sun and air, which process both brightens and fixes the dyed parts. Pliny saw this going on in Egypt, and it puzzled him very much that a cloth dyed in one colour should come out coloured diversely. That reminds me to say a word on the fish dye of the ancients. It was a substantive dye and behaved somewhat as indigo. It was very permanent. The colour was a real purple in the modern sense of the word, i.e. a colour or shades of a colour between red and blue. The real Byzantine books which are written on purple vellum give you some, at least, of its shades. The ancients, you must remember, used words for colour in a way that seems vague to us, because they were generally thinking of the tone rather than the tint. When they wanted to specify a red dye, they would not use the word purpureus, but coccineus, i.e. scarlet of kermes. The art of dyeing, I am bound to say, is a difficult one, needing for its practice a good craftsman with plenty of experience. Matching a colour by means of it is an agreeable but somewhat anxious game to play. As to the artistic value of these dye stuffs, most of which, together with the necessary mordant alumina the world discovered in early times, I mean early historical times, I must tell you that they all make in their simplest forms beautiful colours. They need no muddling into artistic usefulness when you need your colours bright, as I hope you usually do, and they can be modified and toned without dirtying as the foul blotches of the capitalist dyer cannot be. Like all dyes, they are not eternal. The sun in lighting them and beautifying them consumes them, yet gradually, and for the most part kindly, as, to use my example for the last time in this paper, you will see if you look at the Gothic tapestries in the drawing-room at Hampton Court. These colours in fading still remain beautiful, and never, even after long wear, pass into nothingness, through that stage of livid ugliness which distinguishes the commercial dyes as nuisances, even more than their short and by no means merry life. I may also note that no textiles dyed blue or green, otherwise than indigo, keep an agreeable colour by candlelight, many quite bright greens turning into sheer drab. A fashionable blue which simulates indigo turns into a slaty purple by candlelight, and Prussian blues are also much damaged by it. I accept from this condemnation a commercial green known as gas green, which is as abominable as its name, both in daylight and gaslight, and indeed one would almost expect it to make unlighted midnight hideous. William Morris End of section 17 Recording by Julie Barclay